let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Many Americans believe that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the greatest president in the 20th century. He certainly has the newest and biggest presidential memorial in Washington, seven acres on the Tidal Basin, and surely he left a big legacy. To help us explore that legacy, we are joined by Robert Dalek, professor of history at Boston University and author of Franklin D. Roosevelt and American Foreign Policy, 1932 to 1945. Michael Bischloss, presidential historian and author of Kennedy and Roosevelt, The Uneasy Alliance. And John Morton Blum, professor emeritus at Yale University and author of V Was for Victory, Politics and American Culture During World War II. The topic before the house, who was Franklin Delano Roosevelt? This week on Think Tank. America was on hard times when FDR was inaugurated in 1933. The nation was in the fourth year of a Great Depression. 25% of the workforce was unemployed. Roosevelt's first task was to reassure America. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. In the legendary first hundred days of the Roosevelt presidency, FDR launched his New Deal. Congress passed 15 major laws, putting half a million people to work, opening banks, creating the Securities and Exchange Commission and setting into motion the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was to bring water, electricity, jobs, and hope to poor southern states. In May of 1997, President Clinton dedicated this $52 million memorial to our 32nd president. First, the America he built was a memorial all around us, from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Grand Coulee Dam. This monument has been controversial, but so was Roosevelt, and so he still is today. Gentlemen, thank you uh, so much for, for joining us. The late Claire Booth Luce uh, had a, uh, uh, a thought, which was that every American president is ultimately summarized by a single sentence. George Washington, father of our country, Abraham Lincoln, free the slaves, what about Franklin Roosevelt. What's the sentence? He humanized our American industrial system and transformed American foreign policy. Michael Deschloss. I think he improvised a way of fighting, not winning the fight against the Great Depression, and also to win World War II and thus change the United States and the world in ways that he never at the beginning anticipated. We are getting complex sentences, which I don't know if is in the spirit of uh, Claire Luce. John? I don't think I've ever been in the spirit of Claire Luce. <laughs> uh, Franklin Roosevelt led the United States to the creation of a system of economic security for its people and to victory in what was for the world the most dangerous war since the beginning of American history. So w we end up, this is what I expected, I must say, that, that he is perhaps of the great presidents, of the most important presidents, uh, the one that you really do need a complex sentence. Y you can't say he just fought the Depression or he just mm -hmm. fought the war. He really, those were the two pillars, and y you have to link them in summarizing Franklin Roosevelt. Yes. Fair enough? Uh, absolutely. And he served for 12 years longest period of time in, of any president in American history. Well, he, 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 both with depression or the fight against depression and with war, he contributed 
to what Michael has quite properly called improvisations, his, his extraordinary spirit, his personal confidence, which somehow he could make palpable to the uh, uh, country that most of which adored him, his ebullience, uh, and so as I said, his self-confidence, somehow communicated itself to this enormous constituency that was it had been through uh, three dreadful economic years uh, working people without jobs a middle-class people who'd lost their savings and were <coughs> were expecting to lose their homes till a federal program saved them a country with no confidence and no hope and this man brought to that country a spirit which had which trans Ascended the palpable legislation with which your comments began. Of course, right. there were 15 or more right. great statutes passed, but there has never been a president in a time of national crisis who had a more immediate impact on the national cultural psyche than FDR did, mm -hmm. and he did it again the day after Pearl Harbor. Well, <coughs> let me let me. Uh, J John has sort of sketched out this uh, this the great personal characteristics of Roosevelt coming in and uh, sort of re, re inspiriting a nation. And, and we'll talk about that, but let's sort of stipulate that that's so, and it's a great accomplishment. But ultimately, uh, the argument is made is that it was really sort of a trick. He didn't solve this depression. The depression ended under the economic trigger of World War II. Economists now, some mostly conservative economists, I guess, but say, that stuff didn't work. Uh, it's not true. Well, let, let's hear from uh, the, the, the children on this panel here <laughs> first, Michael and then we'll, we'll come back to... Well, in terms of sheer statistics, the United States was not out of the Great Depression by World War II. That was basically solved by building this arsenal of democracy <coughs> that sure was not built to solve the Depression, but was required to fight right. fascism in Europe and Asia. The thing that's fascinating to me, I was born 10 years after Roosevelt died in 1955. And as I've been growing up, you hear of FDR so often spoken of as a big government ideologue. The fascinating thing to me is how little ideological Roosevelt really was. When he came to power in 1932, certainly he wanted to fight the Depression. He felt that government was perhaps the instrument of last resort and he was certainly eager to expand government to do it, and this was someone who grew up uh, didn't, in politics as an admirer of Woodrow Wilson. didn't he campaign in the 1932 election to reduce government spending and, and balance, balance the budget? And campaigned on a balanced budget uh, in a speech in Pittsburgh, and the advice was given him, deny that you were ever in Pittsburgh, when right. he <laughs> unbalanced the budget well, later no, Michael, on. He did say in that Pittsburgh speech, after saying he would try to balance the budget, but not at the cost of human suffering. Absolutely. And that demura is what right. really right. predicted New Deal policy. Exactly. That's, that's, you see, it seems to me, the bottom line. We have all this time that's passed now, and you have the retrospective. And so one can say the Depression did go on, and I think Michael's absolutely right. It took the arsenal of democracy to conquer that. But it's the more fundamental things that were put into place, like the wages and hours law that is very much with us still, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the uh, Social Security. Which we Commission. hope is very much with us. <laughs> <laughs> what was Roosevelt like personally, privately? There are all these stories that he was, just what John said, ebullient and life-giving and inspiriting, but that privately he was a terribly devious man. Is that right? Well, devious, I think, puts a pejorative yeah, spin, yeah. spin on it. He was a great politician, and by the very definition of the term, it means there is a degree of deviousness or manipulativeness. I mean, how do you manage a country of... Uh, he called himself a juggler. A juggler. He also right. once said to Henry Morgenthau, I never know my right hand, let my right hand know what my left hand is doing. Right. So Morgenthau right. said, which hand am I, of right. course? <laughs> and Harold, Harold Dickey's complaint to him, you know, you're the hardest man in the world to work for. And Roosevelt said, why? Because I'm so tough. And Dickey said, no, because you play your cards so damn close to your vest. Uh, and this is fascinating because we're talking about people who were thought of as very close to Roosevelt. Morgenthau, right. the Treasury Secretary. Yes. Dickey's the Interior Secretary. And what you both said 
captures something that's essential, which is that Roosevelt always made these people feel insecure, never made them feel that they were people who even had the assurance of being employed one month hence. He was, he was the greatest politician of the 20th century. And one can take from that the fact that this does not necessarily mean that you're a nice guy. That's exactly uh, right. When did Roosevelt have the sense that there was international trouble of a monumental magnitude? I mean, Adolf Hitler takes office the same year that Roosevelt was, right. 1933. Couple months before. Right. Yep. Excuse me? Couple of couple months, couple months before. before. When, when well, does Roosevelt very he, knew it. he knew it right he, away, but he couldn't do anything about it right away. I mean, the country it, was intensely yeah. isolationist. See, Roosevelt lived, you know, you were talking about his deviousness. The man had what I would describe as a public face and a private face, particularly when it came to... I was not talking about his deviousness. I was talking about other people talking about his oh, deviousness. Okay. I, <laughs> despite my right. tongue, but all you people are such, was okay. hey, geographers, <laughs> I am trying to play, play devil's advocate. He was convinced that the country was, and accurately so, uh, intensely isolationist in the 30s. It wanted no part of involvement in a, another war, certainly not another war, but no, even in... No, in, World War I was a mistake. World War I was a terrible mistake, and the country was just... Not not going to be drawn in. But indeed, did, 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 did he understand, did anybody understand the potential magnitude Roosevelt, of what was going Roosevelt on in Europe? Roosevelt understood it in 33, and he did, he, did, he did something, and he did something about it, which was? Yeah. He officially recognized the Soviet That's Union, right. and he privately said that he did it for a very specific reason, to bring Russia into the balance against Germany and Europe and against Japan, Japan and, and Asia. Asia. He could see the whole thing yes. coming, but as Bob has said, he was too sensitive a politician to buck public opinion, which was so heavily isolationist. Roosevelt, as Bob has said about domestic affairs, had both a private and a public posture. And the private man was constantly pushing to move us closer to an active aid for the opponents of Hitler, and the public man was exercising a restraint because, he, as he put it, he didn't want to get too far ahead of his army. Now, but, one but, other element, yeah. if I could just pipe in for a second, is presidential power. Roosevelt, to fight the Depression, sought a degree of presidential power from Congress and the people that was really unprecedented. And the Congress, to a great extent, said, we weren't able to avert this Depression. We're going to give the president extraordinary powers. And as much as Roosevelt took power in domestic affairs, Congress took away power, and so do the people in foreign affairs. So you have Congress passing enormous uh, isolationist legislation. In such 1937, as, yeah. well, 1937, the House passed something called the Ludlow Amendment, which would have required a national plebiscite to declare war. As it turns out, it w required two-thirds, so it didn't go through. Had that passed, and as I said, it got a majority, would have been very hard to fight World War II. See, what we shouldn't lose sight of is that the man was a great realist in foreign affairs. What he understood was that there had been a long, unspoken, unwritten history of alliance with Great Britain, an American reliance on the British Navy for U.S. national security. Consequently, when he's making the destroyed bases deal with Britain in 1940, what he wants Churchill to commit to is sending the British fleet to North America, to Canada, if Britain is successfully invaded by the Nazis. Now, Churchill won't acknowledge this in public because he doesn't want there to be a suggestion, a hint mm -hmm. of defeatism on uh, the part of Britain. They don't even think of it. Or even think of it. But what Roosevelt is speaking to here is the extent to which the British Navy is a defensive arm for the United States. And Roosevelt, from very early on, is committed to the idea that Britain and France are the first bulwark of American democracy. We shall send you in ever-increasing numbers, ships, planes, tanks, guns. That is our purpose and our pledge. And the President's words meant action as billions of dollars worth of goods start to flow to embattled England and other allied countries. America became the arsenal of democracy. President Roosevelt rallied most of the American people around his New Deal domestic programs. But for the second time in the 20th century, war was brewing overseas. Most of Europe fell to Hitler's blitzkrieg, but America was still reluctant to join the conflict. Then, on December 7, 1941, Japan attacked 
Pearl Harbor. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. December 7th, 1941. Well, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, is Roosevelt relieved? If the Germans and the Italians hadn't declared war on us mm -hmm. after the Japanese Another piece bomb of Pearl Harbor. Harbor. Indeed, immediately after Pearl Harbor, yeah. Morgenthau and Ickes, they want, and Stimson, they wanted Roosevelt to declare war on Germany. But he knew through magic, this capacity to read uh, Japanese uh, military diplomatic traffic, that the Germans and the Italians were going to come into the war against us. They were going to issue a declaration of war four days later. Mm -hmm. And so why let, should let we them take do it? Ha how how do was it? Roosevelt, I mean, at, at that time we had five-star generals. Uh, I don't think we did. No. I think we well, had I mean, four generals. Well, I mean, during the war, yes. that, that yeah. became, uh, Eisenhower got a fifth star and Bradley right. and I guess a few others. Uh, but, but Marshall. Marshall. Franklin Roosevelt was the six-star general, the seven-star yes, general. Yes, he was. Right. How, how was he as a commander-in-chief? Well, the Eric Larrabee's book, Commander-in-Chief, is a sim simply a gem of a book. It is. And it shows how deeply Roosevelt's influence penetrated American strategic decisions. Not tactical, but strategic. Roosevelt ran that war, much more than any of his generals, much more than any one of his allies. And Except Stalin, who had a great, a great area in which to uh, maneuver. Was this just balance of power politics that he didn't want big powers, or was it because the nature of these two powers, Japan and Germany, were totalitarian and I threatening it, ideologically? It I think it, it was both. I don't think you can separate both. them in Roosevelt's mind. But Roosevelt understood global power and global diplomacy. And there were very few Americans of whom that could be said but, at that but time. But Roosevelt rallies the free nations of the world, rallies the American people, builds up the industrial base of the United States. The argument is made that in part because of Franklin Roosevelt's failing health, and in part it is alleged because he was very naive about the Soviets, no. that he gave away the store no. in Yalta. No. Let me, let, me, let me argue against that. Roosevelt's basic policy during the war was to have this public face and the private face. The public face said, we are locked in this monstrous war. Our ally is the Soviet Union. They are sacrificing millions of people. And we have to be as sympathetic and supportive of them as we possibly can. Now, Roosevelt was reflecting mass opinion in the United States. If you go back and look at Henry Luce's article in Life magazine in 1943, which describes the Soviet Union as just like the United States. The article says the Soviet citizens are like Americans. They speak like us. They dress like us. They think like us. Why, they even have an NKVD, which is just like our FBI. <laughs> <laughs> more than he knew. <laughs> more than he knew. More than he knew. This, is, this is Henry Luce, the, Henry ar Luce, the arch anti-communist. Of, of course, yeah. of course. And also, Wendell Wilkie publishes a book in March of 43 called One World, which instantly becomes the greatest nonfiction bestseller in American history. In that book, it's a fantasy about how much the Soviet Union is becoming like the United States. Indeed, the message of that book, One World, is that inside of every Russian, inside of every Chinese, inside of every African, every European, every Asian, is an American waiting to emerge, you see. Kind of, kind of what we believe now. Well, we've or through all our history. Believe. We've, we've always, always, and always believed. And we may have been right. Always well, believed. Our theory well. is that the good ones come here and the, uh, right. the bad ones stay home. But then the basic point is that Roosevelt was catering to the Wilsonian universalism in this country, to the naive assumption that at the end of the war we were going to have a love fest with the USSR that we were going to have four great powers, Britain, the United States, China, and Russia. Four policemen. Um, four policemen. We're going to police the world. We're going to China cooperate. Even and the United shoot. Nations is going to work very effectively. <laughs> See, there'll be a kind of Wilsonian collective security. Yeah. Roosevelt doesn't believe this. So, so, so therefore, <coughs> he says at Yalta to the uh, communists, to Joseph Stalin, who has already killed 20 million of his own people by, uh, by, by that time, where, where there is no freedom to speak, none of the four freedoms that Roosevelt talks about. He says, okay, you guys can have uh, Poland, Romania, ben, Bulgaria, no, what he says, no, Hungary. No. Hungary. What, what he says is, in his own mind, I am a real politician. The Soviets have fought their way across Eastern Europe. They are there in Eastern Europe. The United States is not going to go to war with them to oust them. 
we are going to strike some kind of bargain with them and strike a balance of power in Europe. I think Roosevelt in Yalta was recognizing the situation as it had become. One thing he wanted to do was to nail down Stalin's commitment to a UN. Another thing he wanted to do even more urgently Japan. was to get Russia into the war against Japan. Something he didn't want to do was to keep American troops in Europe after the war. All of his post-war planning was predicated on the assumption the boys come home. The Russians were in East Europe. He was trying to commit them to free elections in East Europe, which Stalin said he was going to hold. Indeed, if Stalin had lived up to the Yalta Accords, we wouldn't have to worry about expanding NATO what, tomorrow. Uh, what did Roosevelt know about the Holocaust? What could he, he knew have, more than he liked to admit. What, what could he have done about it that he did That's didn't a do? different question. Through uh, international Jewish correspondence, American Jews, Rabbi Weiss and others, were really pretty fully informed about the Holocaust while it was occurring. Now the question, apart from that, Bob and I once spent a whole day talking about it, was what could we have done about it? And that's a very tough question. There are revisionists who argue that we should have bombed uh, the areas around the gas chambers. Auschwitz. Auschwitz especially. But that raises some very tough questions because the but, German defenses... But we could have at least let in some refugees. That's one place we could have done more was in refugee policy. We were too late and, uh, in getting to it and we let in too few. He didn't show any significant political courage. Again, he is the politician. Neither did anyone else in the world except the Danes. The story of the Holocaust is a story of total international moral failure with the signal exception of the Danish people. The Swiss are recently being uncovered yes. <laughs> for just the hotel keepers they were. I think there was also in Roosevelt a little bit of sort of an insensitivity that you don't see in other areas of his life. There was a feeling that there were people who were pleading with him to do things like bomb the railroad lines and the other things that could have been done really with very little effort. And Roosevelt was so focused on the idea of simply winning the war as quickly as possible that when you're confronted with perhaps the great crime of human history, Roosevelt really fails the test because that was something that should have superseded war strategy. He didn't see it that way. And no, he also and failed the test. After all, he, he was not great on human rights. The incarceration of the Japanese exactly. Americans was a dreadful case of uh, the misuse of federal and power. He, politically, he was uh, elected four times with the vote of the segregationist South. I mean, but he, and was, he resisted the and very much tied to segregationist he, he politicians. I mean, no one should him. raise him to sainthood, Ben. The point is, he was a great politician. He was a great president, a great one of president. the three greatest. But he wasn't a saint. And I've never met no, any no, saints in no, my no, reading no, of political history. You got, have two questions. Was he the greatest, uh, let's say the 20th century, was he the greatest, was he the most important? Great presidents, of course, are presidents, at the very least, who fa face great crises. Roosevelt confronted two of the greatest crises in American history, the Great Depression and the Second World War. Great presidents must have a sense of national priorities. They must define them. They must get Congress and the electorate to go along with their solutions. They've got to have solutions for these crises. Roosevelt did these things. Washington had the great crisis of American nationality, and that put him as the first great president. Lincoln, the great crisis of American Union, and that put him as the second great American president. Franklin Roosevelt, the crises of uh, economic pain such as the nation had never before experienced, which he ameliorated, and of a foreign threat greater than any that we'd all confronted since the War of Independence, which he helped to overcome. Priorities, correct. Solutions, operable. Constituency, in line. Great president. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Michael Verschloss, John Morton Blum, and Robert Dalek. And thank you. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. 
or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. A note to viewers, whether you admire Franklin Roosevelt or not, this remarkable and controversial memorial is something to see. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.